The title of the message was and is, Who Do You Say That I Am? And it was all based around Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. Who do you say that I am? I'm going to try my best and pray to God that God will give me what I need to do it. Um, I, th I think it's possible. I think it can happen. So we'll go ahead and just read through Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18 again. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Who do you, or should I say, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. 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 That right there will preach all by itself. You know, there's a lot of scriptures that preach by themselves and don't really need an orator or anybody to break it down or explain it. But Peter just spoke out of the authenticity of what he truly believed that day, and he had the revelation. He had received the revelation of exactly who it is that Jesus Christ was, is, and will always be. And so we covered a lot last time uh, based on what Matt was just saying. We covered a lot. And uh, so I, I just wanted to be real brief and just remind you of some of the things that we had talked about. We talked about deity and divinity and what is the difference. Deity refers to who God is, but divinity refers to what God does, okay? The attributes of God. And we took a closer look at that. We talked about how Jesus has been accurately recorded. He's been accurately recorded through the scriptures, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John specifically, up close under a microscope, well, not a microscope, but very close, looking at the life of Christ. And then there's also other sources outside of the four Gospels, which, you know, I'm not going to talk in great detail about that either. I didn't last time. But there's actually nine total inside the Bible and outside the Bible that actually testify to who he is, who he was. And uh, everything, not everything, but a lot of what he did. That Jesus did exist. That Jesus, uh, he did die. He died a sacrificial death on a cross, on wood. Um, some people believe different things about exactly how that happened, um, which I, I don't know that it really matters that much. But I know that he was sacrificed. I know that he was tied to a whipping post. I know that he took stripes across his back. I know the nails went into his hands and his feet. I know the sword was thrust in his side. I, I know this, this is all true. I, I know that the, not just the wood that he died on is not really what it's all about. It's, it's the whole event. It's everything that took place there that sums up the sacrifice. What actually pays for my sin. What actually atones for it and removes it. So I don't want to get bogged down into the, the details of, of things that are, not going to say insignificant, but less significant. Okay? But I do want to say that um, Colossians 2, 8 through 10 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ for in him we're talking about Christ for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead okay and dwells means to house permanently it literally means that and all the fullness of the Godhead so what does Godhead mean Godhead means the state of being God that's what it means in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete. It simply means that in him, everything is satisfied. What we are lacking, what we are lacking in Christ, now that we have found him, everything is now satisfied. He makes up what has been missing, what has been lost, where we fall short. He makes it up for us. He brings it to us. And so in him... He is the head of all principalities and powers. Talking about the spiritual realm. 
talking about spirits and angels and, and, and entities that, that we cannot necessarily see with our human eyes. The Bible is our greatest resource. The four Gospels and their witness to Christ uh, are, are a big part of what we have in the Bible that testifies to him. We talked very briefly about Arius, the pastor of a church that uh, brought a very troublesome and early heresy and anti-Trinitarian doctrine against the church. And so uh, he challenged the church on the meaning of John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says that Jesus is not eternal. He said that Jesus is not eternally God and he was created into his existence. He tried to make Jesus out as if he was some divine hero rather than God, rather than deity. And so then from there branched off some other things where they compared one substance to someone who is actually just similar. And so God is one substance. And we're going to actually get deeper into that, uh, how the Jews were always taught from Moses and on going forward that God is one God. God is one God. And so how do we reckon with that being a church that believes in the tri-unity of God? I, I'm not crazy about the word the Trinity, although we do use it because it's very commonly understood as to what you're talking about when you say it. But when you say Trinity, it seems to put a lot of focus on just three. It doesn't bring it, in my mind, it doesn't bring it to the oneness of God because God is one. Moses said it in Deuteronomy 6, 4. He said it. God is one God. And in fact, the Jews, what they would do, which they were taught to do, was to close their eyes and really focus when they would say it. God is one God. God is one God. Like that, it was such an important concept for them to wrap their minds, to wrap their heads around, to remember with all the paganism, with all the false gods that were around them. This is not modalism. Modalism is something very different altogether. To say that one person takes on three different aspects at different times. That's not modalism. We're not talking about that. We're talking about one substance. And then after Arius, someone else came in and they brought out the idea, okay, well, you know, the word is spelled real similar. Uh, and that was the word similar in their language. It was substance and similar. And, and he said, no, I, I think what was really being said is that Jesus is similar to God. He's not one substance in God. And so the articulation of what was actually being conveyed in Scripture, it, it's there. It's there. And so John 1, 1 through 3 and 14, we read it. We expounded on it last time when I, when I last uh, preached on this. And the struggle with Arius, we talked about how real it was. The Emperor Constantine, the Roman Emperor, who was the first self-proclaimed Christian, the first Emperor of Rome that actually, uh, looking at himself, he considered himself to be a Christian. And again, you know, who's, who's to say, you know, I'm not going to judge that for sure. Constantine said something else that I really did like. Division in the church is worse than war. I, I really did like that. Um, and then from him and the pastors and the bishops that were surrounding him, they brought them together in Nicaea so that they could hammer out what do we believe. There's so much disagreement. There's so much division in the church. We need to nail it down. We need to hammer it down and figure out, okay, what is true according to Scripture? What do we believe? Okay? And so we talked about the Nicene Creed and what was actually brought out and the specifics that certain things in that creed that I wanted to focus on last time where he said, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, God of God, capital G God of capital G God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Begotten does not mean made. It does not mean made. Look it up. Dig deep in the word begotten in, in the Greek text there, and it does not mean made. Be, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things, by whom all things were made. Amen. It was Amen. by Christ. Right. It was by Christ, according to Scripture. So there's an obvious problem we talked about in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. It says that God will not share his glory with any other. God will not share his glory 
with anyone else. Okay? Amen. It's very clear. John 2.11 talks about manifesting forth His glory. John 17.24 talks about the Father giving Jesus glory. Hebrews 2.9 talks about He was crowned with glory. 2 Peter 1.16-17 says that He received from God the Father honor and glory. John 13, 31 through 32 says that the Father is glorified in Christ and Christ is glorified in the Father. So if God will not share his glory with any other, then what do we have going on in these scriptures here? Okay, so we looked a little bit just very briefly at oneness, uh, United Pentecostal churches and their way of thinking, uh, United Apostolic, they have a very similar uh, way of thinking in the oneness theology. Questions to ask. Uh, well, first, before uh, going into that, um, they believe that the Father is the Son, the Son is the Holy Spirit, all three, meaning they're all the same person. Amen. That's what they teach, okay? We do not. We do not. Okay? We do not teach that and we do not believe that because you can distinctly see Three separate wills, especially two separate wills when Jesus is praying to the Father. And Jesus does not want to go to the cross. He's asking if the cup could pass from him. And God tells him, no, you're going to the cross. This is my will. This is what I want you to do. So you see two separate and distinct wills there. Okay? Also, um, the questions that you can ask is, is Jesus his own father? Because he prayed to the father. If Jesus is the father and the father is Jesus and they're supposed to be the same person, then who is it that Jesus was praying to? Was he just praying to himself? Not my will, but my will be done. I mean, you know, what? what no, he, that's not what he said. Okay, but that's the point I'm trying to make is who exactly who was he praying to if Jesus and the father are the same person? Okay, if Jesus is... <coughs> and the Father's will were identical, why did Jesus express desire to escape the cup? Okay, so, and then God the Father and the Son reveal themselves in the Godhead, distinctly, meaning differently, but yet unified, yet together in the decision that's going to be made in the, uh, the direction that's going to be taken. So the triunity of God, the complex unity of God, is, is a better way, I think, to say, uh, to describe the threeness in one. Matthew 3, 13 through 17, Jesus' baptism. We see three persons there represented. We see the Father, we see the Son, and we see the Holy Spirit. Okay? And Jesus' lips were not moving whenever the voice came out of heaven. Right? Jesus' lips were not moving when that voice came from heaven. And he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we already talked about that. We know we don't believe that Jesus was a ventriloquist either. Okay, so that was someone else who did that. So that oneness, uh, that type of oneness idea and concept, it just doesn't work in scriptures. No way it works. And then again, we see in Matthew 17, 1 through 7, we see a similar situation at the uh, transfiguration uh, where Moses and Elijah appeared. And then you had the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. They were with Jesus. And uh, in that transfiguration where Moses and, and the body of Elijah appear, a voice from heaven speaks out again. So again, we see two separate persons in two totally different places. And then God the Father and God the Son, they have two different wills. We already talked about that. Okay, and so the conclusion, we talked about... Um, we talked about Jesus after healing a man forgiving his sins. And the man tells the Jews his story. Why didn't Jesus set the record straight? Why didn't John, the author here, set the record straight when he was being, uh, he was being accused of blasphemy and of equating himself to God? Why didn't he set the record straight if it wasn't true? Because he did it. It was a perfect opportunity to do that. It was, it was a chance to make an illustration out of it and say, okay, Actually, uh, that's not what I'm saying, but that was what he was saying. Jesus, the judge, who shares the Father's honor, stood his ground. Jesus, the judge, who shares the Father's honor and his glory, he stood his ground that day. 
Colossians 1, 13 through 15, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 talks about Jesus being the express image of God. Literally, he's the exact representation, the figure of God. Throughout history, in the Bible, we can see where God appears. God makes himself known and revealed. Um, he appears to Abraham. He appears uh, in, with Daniel in the lion's den as the son of man. So we know that's Jesus. Uh, but there's different places where he shows himself. Yahweh actually appeared to Abraham in physical form. And the Bible says that no man has seen God at any time. So again, there's a problem there. Exodus 33, 20 says it. John 1, 18 says it. 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16 says it. But Yahweh appears to Abraham in physical form. What's going on? So there has to be some sort of explanation for all of this. And again, uh, it all goes back to Jesus Christ. It all goes back to him. He is the express image. He's the person that we see. He's the one that we can see. So, but no one has seen God. Okay, well, what person of God is that scripture referring to? That's the question. In proper context, we have to look at the whole of scripture. We cannot take just one or two scriptures or verses and make a whole doctrine out of it. That's what makes us to believe in the triunity of of God. That's what causes us to believe it because there's just so much. There's not just a little bit here and there. It's all throughout. It's embedded throughout Scripture. Okay? So Jesus is the center of our Christian devotion. Let's look at that. Jesus is the center of our Christian devotion. Why? Why is it Jesus? You know, um, He is more than just a subject for Christian study. He embodies our whole faith. Everything that we believe, everything that we possess in God, everything that we get from God, it comes because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, what he did at the cross, the sacrifice that he provided. It's not because of the miracles he performed before he went to the cross. It's not because of that that we have. It's because of what he did at the cross. And he did raise from the dead. And, and we have to believe that. If we don't believe that, if we don't believe that he was, was raised from the dead, that he is the son of the living God, there's no possible way that we can be saved. In the study of theology, y'all understand what theology is, the study of God. In theology, which is the study of God, inside that realm, there's also the study of Christ, which is called Christology. And that's to ask the question, which was in our theme passage, who is Jesus Christ? Who do you say that he is? Who is he? Who does history say that he is? What is who does the Bible say that he is? And, and in my relationship with Christ, who am I going to say that Jesus Christ is? This form of theology originated with the man himself, Jesus Christ, when he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And then he said, or he asked, who do you say that I am? That's where the whole Christology study started. And they began to study it. He began to teach. He began to break it down. Actually, Peter gave the very best answer that I could ever find. But it's interesting that in all these other major world religions, where you've got these leading figures and characters in those faiths, such as Muhammad and Buddha and Krishna, there is no known study that I'm aware of of Buddhaology. There's no known study that I'm aware of Muhammadology, of Krishnology. Jesus has had so much impact in history. He's had so much impact throughout time that he has truly affected time. Praise God. He has affected time. The timelines are built around him. The timelines are built around him. The incarnation of God, the enfleshment of God, the, the coming down to earth when God stepped down, so to speak, or, or he was born into this earth in human flesh. First Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Some versions say God, or excuse me, some versions say he was manifest in the flesh. That doesn't create a problem for me, okay? 
It doesn't create a, I mean, we're using the King James right now. We're reading from the King James and it says God was manifest in the flesh. There's enough scripture. Look, even if it says he, okay, that's fine. That's okay. It, there's enough scripture just in John chapter one, just there that clarifies who it was that became flesh. It, it's, it's broken down very well. Matthew 1, 23, behold, a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Or, with us is God, is another way that it's been Amen. said or interpreted. And, and this is actually a reference to something that was already prophesied in Isaiah 7.14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. I don't know how much more simple it can get than that, than that name right there. I don't know how much more clear it can be as to who they're talking about right there. The Son of Man title and the Son of God title were both used to speak about Jesus. They were both used by Jesus to refer to himself. And I want to make it very clear that one does not negate the other. Because if you look at one, it gives you a strong idea that he's talking about his humanity. And then when you look at the other, it makes a very strong connection to God. And I'll take it a step further to say that it's saying that he is God. Yeah. Now... <coughs> The Son of Man in the New Testament by Jesus, okay, it's been used a few other times, you know, by others, but by Jesus himself, it was used 85 times that I could count, okay, if I counted correctly. It's approximately 85 times. And that was how Jesus referred, this is what's interesting, that's how he referred to himself the most. He referred to himself the most as the Son of Man. And at first, I was like, okay, well, why is that? Why wouldn't he refer to himself more as the Son of God? You know, why? I, I don't know. Does it really matter? I, maybe not, but I, I don't know. It just really kind of uh, interested me. Interested me. And in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 18, it talks about John, how he was in the Spirit. And he saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt with a golden girdle, his head and hair was white as snow, eyes as a flame of fire, feet like fine brass as burned in a furnace, a voice as a sound of many waters. Let's read Revelation 1, 17 through 18. And we're going to see what happens as John sees this. What kind of a response or reaction takes place Revelation 1 17 through 18 and this is what John does he says and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me fear not I am the first and the last I am he that lives and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and death so what he does when he sees this son of man, the title that, that's, you know, that he's referring to him as, he falls at his feet. He falls down. I mean, he falls straight down. Amen. And all throughout the Bible where you see prostrating, you see people falling on their face, what are they doing? They're worshiping. And that's exactly what John was doing. John was worshiping him. It's not appropriate, people. It's not appropriate to worship someone who is not God. Amen. It's just not. No. And it's been made very clear in Scripture also. It has been made very clear. These are references. Anytime that the words are, or, yeah, the, the words, the title, Son of Man is being used, it's a reference that actually goes back to Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, talks about the Son of Man and how the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. It's really cool because it shows the Son, it shows Jesus, and it shows the Father together in one picture, how the Son comes to the Father. 
in that picture, in that scripture. And so what's really interesting is when John's talking about this, he's making a reference to that. And the word or the title Son of Man was used most in the book of John. John has got, uh, he's got a real handle on that title, you know, a real uh, affection toward it because he uses it quite a bit. Knowing that John's the one who wrote the book of Revelation, right? He got that revelation from the Lord. Okay, and so why were they so angry with Stephen? So angry that they wanted to kill him. <clears throat> Let's look at what Stephen actually said. That's going to be in the book of Acts. Chapter 7. What is it that Stephen could have possibly said to make them so angry <laughs> that like children they covered their ears because they didn't want to hear what he had to say? Are you kidding me? I, it never really occurred to me until studying for this message. And I looked at that, I was like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Like these guys were so mad at what he had said that they couldn't bear to hear the words come out of his mouth and they covered their ears like children. But then like, like beasts, they grab stones and they stone them to death. Okay, let's see, let me find, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. I didn't put that in my notes here. Okay, it's verse 56. Chapter 7, verse 56. It says, uh, And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And when you look up the word stop, that's what it means. They covered their ears. And ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And we know that's who became Paul when his name was changed. So interesting. They were so upset because he made a reference to Jesus as the Son of Man. And also that he was standing at the right hand of the Father. In other words, Stephen got a standing ovation as he was about to go to heaven. Jesus stood up. It was that significant. He was the first recorded martyr to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus said, I'll stand up for this one. And who knows, maybe he stands up for all of them. But I thought that was really, really interesting. But it made him so angry because he referred to Jesus as the Son of Man. Again, they knew the Scriptures. They knew what was said in, in, in Daniel chapter 7 about Him being the Son of Man and the connection with Him being the Messiah and the connection with Him being God. And they did not accept that. They completely rejected that. And it made them that angry that they wanted to kill Him, and they did. Let's look at Mark chapter 14. So every time, Mark 14, 61, every time that Son of God and Son of Man is, is being spoken, it's more of an implication. He's just, he's saying, uh, you know, I am a man, I'm 100% man, and I am God, I'm 100% God. He doesn't, there's not very many times that he actually comes out and he just says it until he's asked a point in question. And that's another thing I was like, well, what's, what's the deal with that? Why is Jesus always so subtle about his communication, about himself being God? Why? Why does he make it so, you know, you might think complicated? Why does he have to be so difficult? You know, why can't he just get to the point and just tell people this is who I am? Because they would have killed him. They would have killed him right then and there. You, you, you've heard it so many times. Jesus laid aside the expression of his deity. He wasn't going to be forced to act as God. The Father would have had to do something from heaven to stop it, you know. But he didn't want to, and the, it was the Father's will. The Father didn't want him to just 
plainly and clearly and, ex- and just easily just throw it out there because they would have killed him. I mean, you see how they acted. You see how they responded. And, and what they were going after was they wanted to catch him in a blasphemy. They wanted to catch him. Uh, what exactly do you mean when you say that, you know, uh, your father? Who is your father? You know, son of God. Son of God, that's blasphemy. You're making yourself equal with God, you know. And so this is the mindset that they were operating in. So if he would have just come out and said, no, I'm not, not going to say I'm the son of God. I'm going to just straight up tell you, what Emmanuel, I am God. God with you right now. That's who they, they would have taken him out right then and there. I mean, his human flesh operating as a human. Yeah, he's performing miracles, but who's he performing the miracles by? By the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit of the Father. That's how he's functioning. That's how he was operating. And so what's interesting is there's only just a handful of times when he's asked that question about being God, about being the Son of God, about making himself equal with God, about being accused of blasphemy or whatever. There's only a handful of times where Jesus just comes out and says, okay, I'm being asked a pointed question and it's a yes, no question. So, you know, and then there's times when it's a yes, no question, but he still doesn't say yes or no. He, he explains, you know, he, he, you know, kind of attacks back, you know, he does. So it's, but notice that when he's standing before Pilate, he just comes out and he says, yes, that's exactly who I am. Pilate's like, is that who you're saying you are? These Jews are saying that you're saying that you're God, you know, that, that you're the son of God. Is that who you're saying you are? And he says, yes, you said it. That's exactly right. That's who I, he's already there, y'all. He's about to get crucified. So there was no reason to hold back anymore. There were certain things that the father wanted to see accomplished in his life and in his ministry. There were certain miracles that needed to be performed uh, one day, I'm going to, I'm definitely, if Matt will let me get back up here, I want to preach and teach around the story of Lazarus and his resurrection. There's such a powerful story. I, I mean, there's just so much there that I had never seen before until recently. And, and these miracles were all leading up to something. They were all pointing to who he was. They were all pointing to who Jesus was. It was to teach them. It was to demonstrate to them. It was to show them. No, uh, yeah, I am a man. I I am. You're you're looking at human flesh standing up here teaching before you. You're looking at human flesh. But but I'm more than just a mere man, is what he was saying and what he was demonstrating to them. I don't have a whole lot of time left. I've got to get moving here. Okay, so uh, Mark 14, 61 through 64. Did I say Mark 14? Yes. Okay. 61. I said it right. <laughs> but he held his peace and answering nothing again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And the Son of the Blessed is just an ex- a term referring to God. A Son of who? A Son of the Blessed. A Son of God is what they were saying. And Jesus said, I am. See, he's, he's very direct. No beating around the bush. He didn't have to, you know, attack back and, you know, like he had done before with the religious leaders. This time, he just straight up gives him the answer that, you know, the answer that the Jews wanted him to just come out and say. And then he says, and you really think Jesus is going to say I am and that's it? No. He says, I am and you will see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest rent his clothes and said, what need we any further witnesses? In other words, you just, he just, he's, he's already testified against himself. He's testified to the fact that that's who he believes he is. You know, so there was, there was no more reason to imply it, but that's what Jesus had done. He had implied his humanity. And, and even in that title, Son of Man, there was still, there, there, it's still there. You know, it's still there. Daniel revealed and showed in that he was seeing visions and dream. He was having a dream whenever that revelation came where he saw the son of man go up to the ancient of days and and revealing and showing him as the redeemer, as the Messiah. So even when he said son of man, it was quite offensive, but it was not as offensive as saying son of God. Okay. Okay. 
So I want to make it clear. I want to make it clear that, see, I, some people would say that, well, when you say son of God, does that mean that he's not God? You know, he's just his son. He's the son of God, but it doesn't say he's God. And this is my answer to that. If he's not God by saying that he's the son of God, then he's not a man by saying he's the son of man. You can't have both. A good argument is going to be a consistent one. And so if I'm going to say that he's not God because he used the title that he's the son of God, then he's not a man by using the title he's the son of man. Although God is one substance, Scripture reveals his threeness. He reveals himself as three in one. There's all kinds of analogies that different people have used. They've used the egg to, to separate, you know, and show three, three components to come together and show one unit, one substance. Uh, but they can all be taken apart and show distinctly that there's three parts. And then I used uh, in my message last time the sun, the S-U-N, to describe and show that, hey, one component, one unit, the sun, shows three different characteristics. The, the brightness of the star is, is a good example of Jesus and his image. How he is the image of God. He's what we see. He's what the world saw when, G, when he came down to earth. He was God with us. And so also we can see the warmth that comes from the heat from the sun. And we can feel the heat. It's a good expression and a good example, just an illustration, showing the Holy Spirit how we feel his warmth and we feel his touch on us. But then the ultraviolet rays, we cannot see him just like the heat. You can't see it. We cannot feel and, and it doesn't really, you know, I can't feel the ultraviolet rays, but it affects me and it can change some things about me. And it's very much like the father. He's very real. I can't see him. And so... That was just, you know, one, one other illustration that that's probably one of my favorites. And then recently I, I, I saw another one that I thought was really good. Time. Let's look at time as a good way to illustrate the Trinity, past, present, and future. How is it possible that three persons, how is it possible that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit could all three be God? How is it possible that the past, present, and the future all be time? All three are different in their own way, but they all, in their essence, they all share the nature of time. They're just, look, they're just illustrations, just analogies. I could give you five, not I couldn't, but if I could give you 5,000 analogies, it would prove nothing. I mean, seriously, let's be real about it. All they do is they illustrate. They only illustrate. And the greatest analogy that God's given us is in his word. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what I'm suggesting to you tonight, where he says here, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are made up of those three components. It's generally accepted. But look at Genesis 1 26. And God said, and God said, let us. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so what I'm suggesting in this analogy, which has come from God's word, that we are made up of spirit, soul and body. That's the three components that make up our person, the essence and our nature of who we are in as a complete package, father, son and Holy Spirit making up the complete essence and nature of God as a whole. He created us in his image. He said that he was going to create man. He said in our, he, God said in our, in our, God said, I'm going to let us make man in our image. 
And so I think that's the most powerful and I think that's the greatest analogy to try to describe to somebody rather than taking something like water or an egg or the sun or, you know, you know, but, but our human minds, you know, we need help sometimes. And so that's why we do it, I guess. Um, Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. It, it looks like two people are saying that there. Does it look like it to any of you? Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. They're both saying it. They're both saying it. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. They're both saying beside me, there is no God. They're saying it in unison. Think about that. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which works all in all. I see the Trinity. I see three right there working actively. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. The word for spirit there is pneuma. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. The word for Lord there is kyrios. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God. The word for God there is theos, which works all in all. I like the way it ends, which works all in all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So, you know, those scriptures just simply show the distinction. That's all that those show. Okay, and I'm not trying to imply that it shows anything more. But it just shows distinction. Nothing can ever replace revealed truth. Nothing can ever replace revealed truth. So spinning off from a bunch of analogies, that's what I would like to say. Nothing can ever replace revealed truth. So when God steps down into our human understanding and he reveals something to me or you or us, that's more powerful than anything else. Look, hey, you have to have a true, genuine connection with God. That's right. You know, if you don't have a connection, if, if, if he doesn't run into you or you run into him or y'all run into each other, however we got to say it, there needs to be a real connection. Because he is real and we're real. Amen. And if that doesn't happen, then there's not going to be any truth revealed. And until I get a revelation of this... I can see it in the black and white of, of the text and I can hear it, you know, from someone like you, but I need God to open up my understanding, to put it in my mind's eye to where I can grasp it, to where I really can get it. No human analogy can fully depict the nature of God. Let's just face it. It's complex. It's the complex unity of God. I rather say try unity of God rather than Trinity because Trinity stresses three persons and it doesn't stress the unity of three. See, that's why I like to say try unity. It stresses the unity of the three. Is that all right? It shows the complexity of God and the difficulty to understand or explain God's triunity. It lends support to my mind. This is Aaron speaking. It lends support to my mind to know that mere humans did not make it up. That the true God of all creation cannot be boxed into a simple explanation of his divine nature. I mean, come on. So because it's such a complex idea and it's so difficult to understand, let's just not believe it. Scripture is emphatic. Scripture is very clear. It's all throughout. So I would rather believe that it's really, really, really difficult to understand my God. He's that big. He's that complex. Amazing. To look at all 
that He's done, to look at everything that we know and we understand that He has created, and His capability. Why is it that anyone could think that the God and the Creator of time, space, the mountains, the hills, the Bible says He weighs the mountain and the hills on a scale and a balance. The Bible says that God has taken the stars and the planets and He thrust them in the air and they hang there on nothing. Like it's velvet, like it's black velvet up there. The Bible says He holds all seven seas in the palm of His hand. Just think how big God is. And so to not be able to understand the complex unity of God, okay, I can get that. But not to be able to accept it? To not be able to accept it when he said it. It is difficult to explain. My answer to that is so what? The question is not does it make sense to our human understanding or can we wrap our mind around the concept? The question is is it biblical? Does God's word give full support to it? How is it possible that the Bible, how is it possible the Bible could clearly communicate the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of God and at the same time declare, declare that God is one God? How is this possible? And that's what really trips people up sometimes. Is the three in one concept really that foreign to us? Deuteronomy 6 4, that's what I had quoted earlier, where Moses says, Hear, O Israel, hear. O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And so when you read that in the black and white text, it can be real easy to just get hung up on what we understand the word one to mean. But as always, it's important to go into the Hebrew, to go into the original, and to understand what the word one truly means. It's really interesting. The word one there, in the Hebrew, it's actually the word ihad or ichad. If you're going to say it like the Jews, you're going to say ichad. Okay? And what it means is united. Whoa, wait a minute. Hold up. Exactly. You're, you're exactly on the path I'm going to. United. How is this possible? Our the Lord our God is one Lord. So how do you reckon the one part? And, and it means united. It also means all together. What is all together? What is united? God is united. Three in one. Three in one. If that's hard to accept or hard to understand, you know, we could have a little bit of help from Genesis chapter one, verse five. In the creation, he talks about the evening. He talks about the morning. They were the first. They were the Ihad day. The morning and the evening are two parts. And together, they make one day. Okay? Just to give a little, little bit more illustration of the word Ihad, Genesis 2, 24, says man... Jessica was already there. Man is going to cleave to his wife. It's the way God designed it. And the two shall be one. The two shall be ichad. They shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. Two persons come together and they equal one. One flesh. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Exodus 36, 13. In the construction of the tabernacle, the Ichad tabernacle, the one tabernacle, there were many, many, many pieces. Many pieces that they brought together. It's the same word, Ichad, to make that one tabernacle. In Exodus 36, 13. I can safely say I believe in one or Ichad God. I do not worship anyone that was created. The Trinity, the triunity of God is not the belief that God is three, is not the belief that 
God is three persons and one person at the same time. That would be a contradiction. Rather, it is the belief that there are three persons in one nature. This may be a mystery, but it is not a contradiction. That is, it may go beyond reason's ability to comprehend completely, but it does not go against reason's ability to apprehend consistently. That was Norman Geisler. Let me say it again, I'm sorry. The Trinity is not the belief that God is three persons and one person at the same time. That would be a contradiction. Rather, it is the belief that there are three persons in one nature. This may be a mystery, but it is not a contradiction. That is, it may go beyond reason's ability to comprehend completely, but it does not go against reason's ability to apprehend consistently. So what he's saying is you may not completely understand the fact. You may not be able to fully explain it, but because you know it is a fact, you can accept it. That's right. You may not want to accept it. You may choose not to. You know, I cannot break down the law of gravity to you. I'm not going to even try. I cannot fully explain it. But I would never, while driving in Colorado on the mountainside, I would never stop the car on the mountainside of the Rocky Mountains and just go jump off the edge because I don't understand and I don't accept the law of gravity. Hundreds and hundreds of feet down. Just because I decide that I want to deny the truth. You know, I go to work every three weeks. I go on a helicopter. And I have no good way to explain how that works. How that helicopter can lift. They would say it's the lift, the drag, the thrust, the weight. That picks it up, that keeps it up, that pushes it forward, that keeps it going. Some have even compared it. And I don't know, maybe my brother-in-law could better... He, he's an aviation guy, so he knows a whole lot more about this. But um, they say that it could even be compared to the bumblebee. That there's no good explanation of how a bumblebee can even fly because the wings are too small for the weight of that, that creature. But the bumblebee flies, and the bumblebee doesn't know that it's not supposed to be able to fly. It doesn't seem to know that its wings are too small and that its body weight is too heavy. And so I get on the chopper every three weeks, and I go. And, and even though... It's very clear, and, and many will tell you, you know, there's no real good scientific explanation, you know. In conclusion, if you'll stand with me, I'll read you uh, just a very short story. The Vietnam War caused the family to be separated, and the father was forced to stay in Vietnam while the wife and two boys were able to come to the United States. For 17 years, they communicated with each other only through letters and pictures. The father could see his boys grow up from a distance. Then finally, the governments of Vietnam and the United States made an agreement that allowed the father to come to the States to see his family. But what if the father said, I don't really need to come see you in person? Communicating through letters and pictures has, been, has worked for 17 years, so it will continue to be good enough for me. God didn't say that. And if it was even remotely possible that God could come down, you know he would. Because God loved us so much. That's exactly what he did. Amen. That's what he did. He sent Jesus Christ to come down. To live. To operate in ministry. And to do what he did. Going to the cross. To give his life for us. So that we could have atonement. So we could have redemption. Amen. And that's exactly what he did for you. That's what he did for me.